In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So this is the only Sunday of the church year dedicated to a doctrine of the church. And it's not a cuddly or transformative doctrine in and of itself. In fact, it seems kind of like a middle school math problem that, uh, that has you scratching your head for hours. One plus one plus one equals one, and you're convinced that it doesn't work out that way. Uh, in fact, it was uh, an early attempt to explain that we are very much and clearly a monotheistic religion even though we have God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, the creator of all things, uh, the revelation of God incarnate, uh, and the God that continues to, to move through our lives, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we use words like uh, three persons but one substance, or uh, uh, the idea of, the, uh, of, the, of a dance, of, of, of a rotation of God in relationship with God's self, uh, you're still not getting fluttery in your heart yet, are you? Uh, it, it really is difficult. And we use, we use analogies to try to make it make sense. We talk about uh, H2O and how if I had a glass of water, it was very much water. And if I stuck it in the freezer for an hour or two, it would still be water even though it's frozen. Uh, and then if I let it sit out for several days uh, and, it, and, it, and it evaporated, it would still have the same properties. Uh, uh, we use the image of an apple. Uh, that the, uh, the skin on the outside is very much apple. If you ask what it was, you'd say apple. And that meaty flesh uh, is indeed part of the apple, as is the core. Um, and, uh, and we keep going on in this, in this circular way. Or the fact that I am father Ben to some, I am dad to others, I am uh, a husband to one uh, particular person, uh, but I'm still one person. We use all of these analogies uh, to wrap our mind around the Trinity. Uh, but uh, what I want to talk to you about is not so much the technical aspects of the Trinity, but what it means holistically. One way to start thinking about it is to think about it in the context of our liturgical year. We are about halfway through the year. In fact, Bishop Shannon talked about the year in two parts. That we start in Advent and we run through the season till this particular Sunday, and this is a pivot point. Uh, and it is the story of God's relentless, absolutely relentless pursuit of us. From the preparation for that Christ child to be born, God coming into the world, those first epiphany experiences of people encountering the living God, uh, the love that was poured out upon the cross, the love that had so much power that even death could not contain it, those Easter experiences, those resurrection stories of people encountering the living God and realizing uh, that nothing could separate them from the love of God, uh, that it still pursued them even after the other side of death uh, into new life. Uh, and then that gift of the Holy Spirit we celebrated last week, that God has been on a tear for us since the very beginning of our liturgical year until now. And this is the summation of all of it. The God who is so robust, we have to come up with some uh, large contraption or large bucket to fit God into that even that can't contain. Uh, and so we come up with the idea of the Trinity. And then we spend the second half of the year, that green growing season, responding to this God that has been relentless in God's pursuit of us. And so that's where we are at this pivot point in our life in the church. And I think we need to think about the Trinity in terms of the nature of God uh, that is anything but static, anything but flat, uh, but is constantly in movement towards us and isn't safe. This is an interesting uh, uh, image that, I, that sits with me. If you've ever uh, been interested in the uh, C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the Christ figure is the lion, Aslan. Uh, and the boy uh, is intrigued uh, reasonably cautious and anxious about approaching this God figure, Aslan, uh, and he asks, is he safe? Is he safe? And the response is, oh, no, boy. He's not safe. He's certainly not safe. But he's good. But he's good. God doesn't promise to be safe or, or, or to allow us to remain safe 
when we've encountered the living God, but God is indeed good and God is indeed loving and God is indeed moving towards us uh, in relationship with us. Uh, and I think this gospel story is one of the most beautiful examples of that, of what God calls us to and about the nature of God. So Nicodemus is a religious leader. He makes his living by being a leader in the church, and he's found a comfortable position, uh, uh, negotiated nicely with Rome uh, as a leader in his church community. He has status, he has a healthy living, uh, and he has the assurance of knowing uh, that he understands God, and that God has flattened nicely into his pockets so that he can enjoy the comforts uh, of, of what he has been afforded in the church and in the culture of the time. But something doesn't square with him. Something is gnawing at him. Something tells him that there's more to this God than adherence to these particular laws. That the way that he has been taught to convey God to the world, unless we think this is uh, 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 of a particular religion, each religion has tried to flatten God over time, has tried to make God conveniently fit into their back pocket so they can go about the way of life that they want, that they can live conveniently uh, and I think it's a question that we should all ask ourselves. Are we trying to fit God into our pocket now and in this day? Uh, but something is gnawing so fully at Nicodemus uh, that he's willing to risk. But not everything yet. In fact, I think he goes to see Jesus in the, uh, the dark of night hoping that he realizes this is all just smoke and mirrors. That he can discredit it. That he can go back to the comfortable, safe God that he's in charge of. And so he goes in the dark of night, and he visits Jesus, and Jesus says, you've been trying to fit God into your pocket. You've been trying to flatten God uh, so that God fits into the order that you've conceived. But the true task of being a follower of God is not fitting God into you, but jumping into God, being baptized from above, giving your life into God, not taking life not taking God along on your life's journey. And it gnaws on him. And he asks a whole bunch of questions, and the conversation is somewhat circular. And he walks away, and we're not quite sure uh, whether this was just enough uh, gibberish for him to be able to wash his hands of it and say, you know what, I gave it a whirl, but I'm going to go back to my way of being, or whether he's still being transformed by it. And in one of the beautiful Easter stories that takes place uh, between the cross and the empty tomb, is Nicodemus' Easter story. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus puts everything on the line. He dives into a God who is anything but safe. And he says, you know what? I'll help pay for the funeral costs. Let me take this man off the cross. Let me pay to have him uh, 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 wrapped and, and prepared for, for uh, burial. Uh, and in doing so, we start to see that something transformed in him, that the encounter with the living God left him changed and moved to a new place. When we meet the Trinity, we meet a God who is in relentless pursuit of us, a God who would do anything for us, but a God who calls us not just to flatten God and fit him in our pockets so that we can go about feeling, uh, feeling blessed in the way that we live our lives, but a God who deeply wants us to jump in to that wonderful, loving relationship that God has with God's self. And God deeply yearns for us. So the question is, we see how Nicodemus' Easter story ends. How's our story going to end? Are we willing to leap into that triune, abundant God and watch our lives transformed in anything but safety? Amen.